everybody. Thanks for joining me for another one-man review. Today I'm looking at Sensei's Pious Lie by Akane Torikai. Uh, I have no idea who this author was or really what this book was. I was just looking at, you know, the new Diamond releases for the week and the cover caught my attention. Something about it stood out to me as seeming different from the run-of-the-mill manga. I looked up the premise and the premise sounded really interesting and sophisticated. It sounded like it was along the line of a lot of other manga that I'm enjoying right now, like Blood on the Tracks and Siguatera, and then Ennio Sanyo's work like Goodnight Pun Pun, um, and the, the rest of his body of work. He's one of my favorite. Uh, I was not surprised halfway through this when I went to look who the author was and see what else they'd done to find out that this is Ennio Sanyo's wife, because even though it's not as surreal and, and imaginative as his work, there's a kind of dark drama to it that feels similar to his work and those other couple of works that I mentioned. Um, so that, that kind of made sense to me. So Akane Torikai is someone who I'm really enjoying this work and I'll be trying to find uh, the rest of her work and to see if it, it, if it maintains that kind of tone throughout because I find this to be a very impressive book. It's a difficult book. It, it's not easy, and that's why I like it. I like when people take on difficult subjects and show them in their full complexity and don't break them down into um, a binary. They don't break it into a black and white understanding of a subject. This this book is focused on sexual abuse and rape, which is things that Ennio Sanyo kind of has focused on in his work as well. Um, and some of those other works I'm, I'm reading... Uh, focus on sexuality or abuse and stuff in interesting ways. Um, it starts off with a binary, very, you know, very clear binary, where the main character, um, Misuzu, is pulling apart chopsticks and saying that you can split people into two groups and one group is inevitably going to come out on top at the expense of the other group. Uh, and shows a number, quick ones, sluggish ones, uptight ones, easygoing ones, blah, blah, blah. And then includes men on like the winning side and women on the losing side and showing when the chopstick breaks that this side gets a little bit more of the break. And I thought that was a really sophisticated way to show it. Um, an unsophisticated binary view of the world. But the story evolves to show like why this is her view of the world and that there's other characters whose life experience teaches them the opposite. Um, or teaches them something else and the way those characters come into conflict with their own personal damage uh, and and push each other's views on the world is really sophisticated and complex and real life stuff it's not these like ham-fisted kind of pounding home some kind of political message it's it's real life human stuff um, and it's it's handled in a long form way which is interesting so this is Mizuzu uh, she's meeting her friend Monaco, and Monaco's uh, fiance Hayafuji, and those three are kind of a primary triangle. And then there's a fourth main character that you get introduced to later. Um, Monaco is Misuzu's friend, and uh, Hayafuji is Monaco's fiance, but also. Uh, Masuzu's abuser. He, he he raped her and, and he continues to um, abuse her and rape her throughout the book. And like, it's not limited to just rape. It's other types of harassment uh, behind behind the back of his fiance, who he, he's not having sex with anymore. He, he can't find her attractive. He, he needs to have that um, predator thing going on. To, to get aroused. And so there's that really gross, dark, complex relationship uh, between the three of them that plays out through the book. Some of that's a little spoilery. I apologize, but I, you know, I got to cover the basics of the book. Um, something else I've really, really been enjoying about these manga and manga in general is the decompression. I'm so used to the American comics, which are pretty much like going and watching a two hour movie. You know, you have to tell all the story in a two-hour movie. Things get compressed, and real character development can't play out. And I think that's been the like the decline of movies has been because TV has really been able to get better and stretch out and tell better stories with more 
character development in them. And it's TV has become, you know, to me, the sophisticated thing to do with film. And manga feels like it's ahead of the curve in that regard still to me uh, compared to most American comics that are more compressed. And I'm, I'm really thinking a lot about the decompression. I mean, it's, it takes a lot longer. Uh, and, and so there's a reason, like, if you're only one artist over over here working by yourself or someone working with the team, you, you've got to work a little more compressed in your stories. But that type of sophisticated, dramatic decompression, I'm really, really enjoying. A, a great example of that is the end of the first chapter is just the big reveal cliffhanger moment that, like, in an American comic would be like, and this character's a werewolf. Uh, in this, it's like, hey... Uh, Mizuzu's a teacher and you get this big reveal cliffhanger page of like all right class let's begin and that that actually lands with some some kind of emotional impact and dramatic impact in the story is really interesting and really impressive to me um, that that really shows the power of the artist and the author and it it shows how you don't always have to be a werewolf or possessed by a ghost or I don't know these kind of gimmicky tropey things and that yeah, that's impressive to me. I wish I could. I wish I could do something like that. Uh, in the second chapter, you start off with a very standard image of Mizuzu's back of her head with her ponytail, and I'll talk about that on another image because I I found that to be a really interesting key symbol throughout the thing related to uh, predation and abuse. But you immediately get um, introduced to the fourth main character. Nizuma, who's a student in her class, and you get the sense right away that he's obviously has something going on with him. The other kids are kind of poking fun at him. The girls are, you know, calling, making fun of him, calling a virgin, telling him he's gay, maybe. Um, and so he's taking a lot of abuse from that. But it starts to come out rumor that he's he's had an affair with an older woman, and you know he's been a, basically abused by. It, this this older woman but uh mizuzu can't believe that because she has been abused herself and so she can only think of men as predators and like well you know if a man's having sex like if he didn't want to he wouldn't do it and so she's having a hard time believing nizuma as his advisor and then that starts to create friction like sexual tension between them as well um, but here you see some uh, hayafuji um, abusing Mizuzu, taking illicit pictures of her that he then uses for blackmail and things like that. Um, there was also a hint in the in the news on this one page that there's a criminal that's been repeatedly stabbing people. I thought that was maybe building up some other plot thread, but it hasn't showed up yet. But it seemed like a strange thing to mention. So I don't know if there's some other plot line developing. Um... This this symbol of the ponytail here that I said I'd come back to, this is when uh, Mizuzu first has to encounter Nizuma and talk to him about like what hey what's going on you know we're hearing these rumors um, we need you to deny these rumors because we can't have students like sleeping with older women and they start to have that difficult conversation that she can't believe um, they go back to this ponytail image which shows up all the time. And I thought that's really interesting. Uh, I remember a long time ago, maybe this is a gross self-admission on my part, but in a, in a book that deals with the more uncomfortable things, I think it's it would be good for our society to admit uncomfortable things about ourselves. So I'll, I'll admit something at the risk of pissing people off. Maybe, I don't know, whatever. Um, I remember like when I was younger, I would go to the gym and like, if there was someone in front of me who had a ponytail, I found that really attractive. Or if I saw a girl running down the street with a ponytail, I found it really attractive. And I, I'm always the type of like person who's going to ask why. Like I'm never just going to be like, oh, ponytails are hot. Like after a while, I think, man, I, every time I see a girl, especially if a girl's running with the ponytail, I would find it really attractive. And I thought about what that could be. And one of the things that I thought is 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 that some kind of evolutionary built-in response, a predator-prey response to like a bouncing tail, a predator chasing a prey with a bouncing tail? Like I would see people running down the street with a ponytail and something about the bounce of it was attractive to me um, and in a way that felt 
you know, not quite right in a way that felt predatory. And so I think that's what's going on in this book. Um, I think the artist has picked up on this ponytail as a symbol of prey and that men are going to chase the tail of the prey uh, because she keeps coming back to this image over and over. You're almost always seeing Mizuzu from behind. And that's the kind of like subtle psychological things that are being pulled off in this genre. I don't even know. I don't know enough about manga what this genre is, but these adult dramas that they're doing um, that really impress me. Uh, th there's a really funny scene in here where there's just some high school kids. Uh, you know, there's a lot of other characters in this book cycling through it. Uh, it's not just the main four, but I love this scene where this mother catches a daughter with a, a guy in her room and they're going after it. And he just like happily like pulls out and shows her that they're using protection <laughs> and then like the girl freaks out like that she's showing her mom that um so i don't know it's just like a different a different culture a different view of sexuality uh, i can't imagine an american parent handling it that like that i don't know maybe some people um and then later in the book you start to get more of like uh some really nice dramatic scenes of how Monaco and Hayafuji's relationship is falling apart. Um, so her, her preparing for him and him coming up with excuses and not coming home. Like this is really heartbreaking stuff, I think, and difficult to read, but you know, really well drawn. It's, it's a simpler style, you know, it's not so bombastic as any of Sonia or, so, or some of the other people. Um, it's not the crazy expressions of Siguatera. There's, it's a little calmer, but it's, it's still really powerful in how quiet it is. Um, so this abuse, like, uh, yeah, I think it needs to be that way. I think it needs to, the art needs to be a little bit more understated or the abuse would be too horrific to look at. So I, I'm really excited about this series. I'm really excited about Akane. Torikai as a mangaka, and I'll be looking for more work that she's done. I'm definitely pre-ordering the rest of these books, and I would highly recommend it to everyone else. Um, after you've after you've ordered a copy of this, if you still got some money left over, make sure that you start saving up some bucks for Sean's next release that's coming out from Living the Line. Uh, a really, this is a kind of quiet, brooding manga. If you want the opposite of that. He's got Plaza coming out by Yuichi Okayama, and that's going to be a bombastic, loud, rhythmic uh, visual, visual treat. So be saving up for that as well. All right, thanks for following along. Take it away, Jack. You want to see all these books? Smash that subscribe button and the like button and the bell, and then you get them.